Let's go to the word. Father, we thank you for this day. Father, we thank you that you are for us, your children. And Father, whatever powers may be opposing us, whatever forces may be poised against us, Father, we thank you that because you are for us, um, we will be victorious. Father, may we experience your victory day by day. And Father, as we come to your word, may we do so in the power of your spirit. Father, may you use your word to encourage us, to give us endurance, to grant us peace, and to fill us with hope. Father, this is our prayer, and we ask that you would bring it about for the good of each one who sits under your word this day, and above all, May you bring it about for your glory and for the glory of Christ Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> May 1st. May 1st. That means it is May Day. May Day. Now, when I think of May Day, I, I think of the, the coming of spring. May baskets filled with flowers or candy and given anonymous, anonymously as acts of kindness to others, I, I think of frolicking around uh, a maypole. Now I wrote that and I thought, did I ever actually frolic around a maypole? Anybody here ever frolic around a maypole actually, literally? I, I see a couple of hands. Okay, well that's good. I'm, I hope it was an enjoyable memory for you and uh, maybe we should do that someday. Put a maypole out here and frolic around some Sunday morning. We'll do that next Sunday, May 1st, whenever that comes, okay? So we, we think of days, we think of the, the coming of spring, sunny days, and so forth. That's one May Day. But really, that's not the one that I was thinking of this past week. In my mind, I was thinking, May Day, May Day, May Day. The international cry of distress originated in 1923. And it was officially standardized back in 1948 as the universal cry of distress. It was the idea of Frederick Mockford, who was a senior radio officer at Croydon Airport in London. He came up with the idea for May Day because it sounded like the French word, and you'll have to pardon my French here, because I'm not sure exactly how to pronounce it. Except that it sounded like May Day, <coughs> which means in French, help me. So whenever, we, whenever a pilot or someone on the sh- ocean is in trouble, in distress, they send out that cry, help me, help me, help me. So my ruminations on May Day, which led me to thinking about May Day, help me, ultimately led me to Romans chapter 15, verse 13. (coughs) That's a good verse for May Day, May 1st, or any other day for that matter. And it is an excellent verse for any one of us whose life situations are leading us to cry out to God, May Day. Mayday, mayday, (coughs) help me, help me, help me. The verse, may the God of hope, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing. So that the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. Prayers such as this, as we find them in the New Testament, are are often referred to and called wish prayers. They they are prayers expressed to God, asking God to shape the future of the one being prayed for. That, that, That word, may, it's a cry to God saying, this is where I am, this is where they are, this is where I want them to be. This is what I want you to do in them and for them. Paul's wish for the church, for the believers in Rome, 
was that they would have a larger degree of hope going forward than they were presently in that moment experiencing as he wrote to them. <clears throat> this was a group of believe, believers who, as we'll see, could, could benefit and would benefit from an infusion of hope into their lives. He knows that for them, life seemed to be daunting. And the terrain under their feet was steep and foreboding. And so he prays for them. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing. So that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound. <coughs> you may be filled with hope. Hope. Hope is a treasure that sustains the Christian in every season and in every experience of life. Paul, in his prayer for the Christians in Rome, he, he offers them and he offers us a crash course on hope, which, which he intended as encouragement for them back in the first century, and that God, by his Spirit, intends for our encouragement here in our day. Let's take a look at what Paul teaches us and taught them about hope. The first thing that we notice is this, that we notice our need for hope. We need hope because oftentimes our lives are filled with things that discourage us. We're filled with discouragements. Now, now before we delve too far into Paul's prayer for hope, let's be sure that we understand what hope in fact is. I went to Webster's Dictionary and, and found this. Hope is a desire accompanied by expectation of or belief in fulfillment. There is an expectation that things will get better. That, that's what hope is, an, an expectation. Now, as used in the scriptures, hope carries much of the same weight as this definition, but with one addition, one biblical commentator defines hope like this, biblical hope in this way. It is a confident expectation and now here's the difference of divine saving action. See, what we find in Scripture in regards to hope is, is we have an expectation that God himself will come to the aid of his people. He is for his people. And he will not abandon them in their distress when they cry out to him, Mayday, Mayday, Mayday. The expectation, the hope of the child of God is that God has a listening ear. The father's ear is tuned to the voice of his child. So there is that confident expectation of divine, of God's, of our heavenly father's saving action on behalf of us. The hope that the biblical writers always point us towards is a confident expectation of God's activity on behalf of his people. Hope of this nature, that, that God would come forward and act on behalf of his people, that was a message that the Christians in Rome needed to hear. Because as you read between the lines, as you read the letter that Paul wrote, the, the, the first 11 chapters are, are theological, the closest thing to a systematic theology that Paul ever wrote. But then as you come to chapter 12, there is a transition from theology to practice. Now this, in light of who God is, in light of what God has done, this is how it should impact you. This is the difference that being saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ brings. And the believers in Rome... They needed to know the truth, and they needed to know how that truth would play out and make a difference in their lives, because they, they were discouraged. And they had reason for discouragement. We, as we read through the early chapters of chapter 12 of, of, Rome, of Romans, we, we find that they were experiencing persecution. Paul says in Romans chapter 12, verse 14, 
bless those who persecute you. Now, now this wasn't, bless those if you ever are persecuted. No, Paul knew what was going on in Rome. Bless those who persecute you. He knew what they were experiencing. And then he says the same thing in, in chapter 12, verse 17. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. He says, I know what's happening. You are not being treated kindly or fairly. You're being treated with evil. He says, but, but don't go tit for tat. Don't go eye for eye. Don't repay anyone evil for evil. And then verse 19. So you see a pattern here. This is what they were experiencing. Do not take revenge, but leave room for God's wrath. When people are treating you unfairly and unkindly and unjustly, the instinct is to lash back, to lash out, to take revenge. And Paul says, no, when you are persecuted, trust in God. Wait. On him. When you cry out, mayday, mayday, mayday. Don't solve your own problem. But wait for divine activity and salvation and saving on your behalf. And then chapter 12, verse 21. Do not be overcome by evil. Don't fall in line. Don't get in step with those who are treating you poorly. Who are persecuting you. Don't become like them. <laughs> don't get in step with them, but overcome evil with good. So they were facing persecution. As we look in the history, we know that as Paul was writing this, the emperor of the Roman Empire was Nero. At the time of Paul's letter, persecution under Nero hadn't reached its zenith yet. But it was certainly present, not so much in the taking of lives at this point, but certainly hostility towards those who claimed the, the name of Christ. See, these Christians, they, they were out of step with society. The, the Roman Empire, the emperor, the administration didn't care if they worshipped Jesus. That was fine. All they asked was that on... Occasion, they would take just a little pinch of incense, throw it upon a flame, and say, Caesar is Lord. Caesar is God. Now, you know, Jesus, that's fine. Just acknowledge as well the divinity of our Lord and Savior, Nero, the emperor. And Christians would not do that. They would not bow their head. They would not... Give that pinch. And so they were open to the hostility of the empire and of their Gentile nation or neighbors. So, so they, they, needed, they were discouraged because of the persecution that was coming their way. But, but also they were discouraged because they were living in a sex saturated culture where every single appetite was being fed. Romans chapter 12 talks about persecution they were experiencing. Romans chapter 13, verse 13, talks about the culture that they were in. And, and so Paul writes, let us behave decently. Notice what he says, let us behave decently. He said, I know the culture that you're living in, They're not behaving they are not behaving decently. He said, I know you're swimming upstream. I know that the culture you live in, the world that you're living, they live by one philosophy. If it feels good, do it. If it brings you joy, no matter what God says about it, go forward with it. And that was the culture they were living in. But Paul says, let us, he's talking about his fellow believers in Jesus Christ. Let us behave decently. As in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. They're doing that. We're not. Rather, clothe yourselves. Put this on. Clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ. And do not think about how to gratify the desires of the sinful nature. 
like everyone else is. You know, don't think about, don't meditate on, don't focus on finding that which satisfies the appetites of the non-Christians around you. Historians tell us that at the time of Paul's writing to the book of, or the book of Rome, the, the letter to the Christians in Rome, the, the, the city of Rome had a population of about a million people. It was a big town, big city. How many Christians were there in that city of a million? Some suggest maybe as few as a hundred. Some are optimistic and say, well, it's maybe more like a thousand Christians among those million people in the city of Rome. Whatever the number, the, the number of Christians was minuscule, which made life that much harder. They were living, swimming upstream in a culture that did not honor Christ or the ways or the holiness of Christ. And so there was persecution, there was the culture, and then as we go to chapter 14 and 15, we find that there was in-house bickering. There was church dissensions. This, in large measure, is the subject of chapters 14 and 15. As Paul writes, As for the one who is weak in faith, welcome him. Have relationship with him, if, but not to quarrel over opinions. You know, hey, let's, let's have a conversation. You know you're wrong, don't you? He says, hey, let's, let's accept one another, let's welcome one another, but not just so you can win a fight and, and check off, ah, I got that point across. No, as for the one who is weak in faith, welcome him. But not to quarrel over opinions. We who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Not to press our own preferences or opinions or convictions. But to live in harmony. So this bickering is within the church at Rome, what was between two parties that Paul identifies as the weak and the strong. Now, a, a close reading of these chapters in the book of Romans reveals that there were tensions within the church between Christians who had been saved out of Judaism who believed that Jesus was the promised Messiah. And Christians who were saved out of paganism, who were, whose background was as a Gentile. And so there in the church in Rome, you had a church that was made up of Christians who had been Jews and Christians who were Gentiles by birth. And something happened in the history of Rome that really sort of raised up those differences. In 49 AD, Emperor Claudius told all of the Jews, get out of town. We don't want you in our city of a million people in Rome. You're just a detriment to us. And so he kicked all the Jews out. And Claudius didn't make a, any distinction between Jews and Christian Jews. If you were Jews... You're gone. You're history. And so what happened in 49 AD, all of the Christians in the Roman church with Jewish background and heritage left the city. So what happened? From that point forward until AD 54, five years later, all the churches in Rome were made up of Christians with the Gentile background. Well, after Claudius died, the Jews were welcomed back. The Christian Jews, they came back to Rome, they came back home, and they went back to church. Except it wasn't the church they remembered. All of a sudden, it had a distinctly Gentile flavor to it. And their Jewish 
background, their culture, their customs about the Sabbath and about this day and that day and about this food and that food. All of a sudden, they were coming together and there was tension as, as the Jew, the squished Christians coming back said, hey, you know what, let's make it like it used to be. And the Gentile Christians, we moved on from those things. And so there was bickering. There was tension. There were sparks flying. There were tempers flaring. Sides were taken. And it wasn't any fun to go to church any longer. And so the Christians were discouraged. Their journey was tough. And their hope for the future was teetering on the brink of extinction. Which brings us to 2022. Any reasons for discouragement these days? In our own nation, there is overt hostility to the Christian faith, if not national persecution. But, but certainly, I, I think it's safe to say that in our day, hostility towards the name of Christ and the people of Christ is stronger, more open than it has been at any other time in our 200 plus years history as a nation. I think that's true. And, and so we, we sense the tension. And in other parts of the world, there is not simply overt hostility towards the name of Christ and the followers of Christ. There is actual persecution that surpassed anything in the days of the Roman Empire of the followers of Jesus Christ. Our culture is a moral-less society which celebrates, if it feels good, do it. And then we have concerns, ah, you know, what's my retirement fund looking like? I was working, I, 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 I thought, you know, I'm going to check in and see how, see if there's any adjustments I need to make uh, in the environment in which we live. And, and so I, I called the people and I said, you know, do I need to make some adjustments? You know, put this here or there. And she looked and she said, no, you're, you're in good, good shape. Here, here's the advice I have for you. Don't look. <laughs> Don't look. Just ride it out. You know, we, we have cause for discouragement. We, we live in... Uh, you, you have any concerns about the, the agenda the federal government is forcing upon our public schools? Any discouragement from gas and grocery prices? You know, there, there's a lot of reasons why, as, even as followers of Jesus Christ, we can grow discouraged in the day in which we live. Are we discouraged? Do we need hope? I think we do. I think we do. So that's our need for hope, because there's dis reasons for discouragement. But what Paul emphasizes in Romans chapter 15, verse 13, is our source of hope, which is God himself. Remember our def definition of hope? It is a confident expectation of of divine saving action, of God's intervention on our behalf. Hope, true hope, biblical hope, lasting hope, is found only in the saving activity of God in which he works for his glory and for the good of his child. Paul believed that the Roman believer's only hope was to be found in God. Not in the strength and the stability of the Roman Empire. Hope was not to be found in the dictates of the emperor or the politicians. Hope was not to be found in the innate goodness of fellow citizens of the empire. But hope, true hope, was only to be found in relationship with God. Believing this, Paul prays on behalf of the Christians in Rome. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. Now, notice several things that Paul says here. Notice that, that hope is found in the nature of God. Paul understands his readers. And it seems he, he understands us, or me, 
As Paul winds up his letter to the Roman believers, he he reminds them of the nature of God. He said, in your circumstances, in your discouragement, do not forget who God is. So in chapter 15, verse 5, he, he speaks of the God of endurance and encouragement. And in chapter 15, verse 33, he speaks of the God of peace who will be with us. And then in chapter 15, verse 13, our verse here, Paul speaks of the God of hope. The God who is the source, who is the wellspring, who is the fountain of hope. That encourages us. The believers in Rome needed to be reminded that God is never discouraged. He's the God of hope. Not the God who is the source of discouragement. He is the God of hope. And he gives us a picture that that God is in heaven on his throne... And God in heaven on his throne, our heavenly father, he never is up there wringing his hands saying, oh my, I didn't see that coming. Wow, who would have thought? No. He is on the throne, never discouraged, and never giving discouragement. He's never worries. But he knows how the story for each one of his children will end. Because he has written the ending for each one of his children. And he has done so with great love and great care. His nature is hope. And he gives his children hope even in the most desperate of times. Hope is found in the nature of God. He is the God of hope. He is the God who is the wellspring and the giver of hope. But but he also reminds us that hope is experienced in relationship with God. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing. And I like how the NIV translates that. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him. You see, there is a correlation between the experience of true biblical hope, a confidence that God will intervene, and our relationship with him as we trust and place our trust in him in every situation and in every circumstance. Remember that hope is a confident expectation. It is trust in divine saving action. It's confidence, it's trust that when we cry out to God, mayday, 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 that cry for help is not going to fall on deaf ears, but we have that trust, that confidence that it will fall on the ears of our Heavenly Father who gave His Son, Jesus Christ, that, as Andrew said last week, so that we can be reconciled into relationship with Him. That is our confidence. That is our hope. One person has said that in the absence of trust, there can be no relationship. But in the presence of trust, there is relationship. And by trusting in Christ, we can avail ourselves of all that God is. And we can experience all that he has to give to his children. Including endurance and encouragement and peace and hope. And not just a drop of hope. God doesn't use an eyedropper to give us hope. No, as we trust in him, as we live in a relationship with him, he gives us so that we abound in hope. So so hope is experienced in relationship with God. And finally, Paul tells us that hope is fueled within us through the word of God. How do we find hope? We go to the Word. It's not stated here as explicitly in chapter 15, verse 13. But Paul makes this very clear earlier in the chapter, chapter 15, verse 4. As he writes, For whatever was written in the former days, he's talking about the Old Testament and the, and the Word of God, the Scriptures. For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, our exhortation, 
And remember, as we saw in 1 Peter, exhortation me is the combination of instruction and encouragement. For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction. That through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures, you might have hope. Paul says, if you want to be encouraged, if you want to battle and do away with discouragement in your life, he says, here's how you do it. You put your face in the book, in the word of God, in the scriptures, because that is the means, the avenue by which God says, my hope will be channeled and funneled into your life. You, you, you want to live in discouragement, stay away from the word of God, Right? If you like discouragement, close the book. Set it aside. But, but if you want hope, if you want encouragement, if you want endurance, if you want peace, if you want joy, then open the word. Put your nose in the word. Because that is the channel of God's grace and of his hope to his children. That is how he speaks. Hope into the lives of the discouraged. There's no word in your life. Paul says, well, there's, there'll be no encouragement and endurance. No word in your life, there'll, there'll be no peace. No word in your life, there'll be no expectation of divine deliverance. No word in your life, there'll be no hope breathed into your life. But <laughs> if you give yourselves to the word of God, there will be endurance and encouragement and peace and hope. God is our hope for the future, for tomorrow and for those who are in Christ Jesus for eternity. May our trust be in him, the one who is the God of peace and the God of endurance and encouragement and the God of hope. How do we know that? He reveals that to us and he infuses us with hope through his word. And through the living word, Jesus Christ. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing as you trust in him. So that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. So, so the question is, what are you filled with this morning? Are you filled with discouragement? Are you filled with hope? You know, discouragement, God it never says in Scripture that God is, is the God of discouragement. So if you are battling discouragement, recognize its source. It is in the enemy, the devil, who prowls along, around like a roaring lion, looking to see who he can devour. And he devours you through discouragement, through a closed Bible. Uh, but if you want to be filled with hope, open the word. Give yourself to the word. If you've never all crossed that line of faith in Jesus Christ. The reality is, if you're not a follower of Jesus, you really have no cause for hope. Right? Because you're not taking your cue from him. You're living life on your own. But as we turn to Christ, we find the power of the Holy Spirit indwelling us. And we will find ourselves abounding in hope. True hope is never gener self-generated. It only comes through living in fellowship with God through faith in Christ and in immersing ourselves in the word of God and living under the influence of the Holy Spirit. There and only there does hope abound. Again, these words. For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction that through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. And then Paul says, may the God of hope. And let's make this personal. If you're, follow, if you're battling discouragement as a child, child of God this morning, let's make this personal. Let's make this a prayer personal. May the God of hope fill me with all joy and peace as I trust in you. So that by the power of the Holy Spirit, I may abound in hope.
Oh, may we find these words to be good words. May they be hope-inducing words whenever we encounter those mayday, mayday, mayday moments. And may this prayer and the truths it contains, may they prove to be the guiding light that renews our joy and our peace and hope within us. The psalmist writes, Psalm 147, verse 11, The Lord delights in those who fear him, who put their hope in his unfailing love. Hope flourishes in those who know that they are supremely loved by the one who is the source, the wellspring of hope, and choose to trust in him. Earlier we sang, I hope it wasn't just words earlier. And if it was just words earlier, I hope it's confidence now. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean or trust in Jesus' name. When darkness seems to hide his face, when discouragement comes, here's where I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds with in the veil, Christ alone, cornerstone, weak, discouraged, made strong in the Savior's love. Through the storm, he is Lord, Lord of all. May that be the rock on which we stand as we close this morning. Would you stand as we sing together? Savior's love through 
God's people said, Amen. Amen. Go in peace.